Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello and welcome. My name is Jacob Steele, the events manager for Banyan Books and Sound. Today, we are delighted to be hosting Julia Cameron in conversation with Joel Hutinos on Julia's new book, Write for Life, Creative Tools for Every Writer. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that although uh, participants are joining us from around the world, it looks like there's uh, 850 registrants today, the uh, physical location of Banyan Books is on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So I wanted to uh, honor that. Uh, Julia Cameron, hailed by the New York Times as the Queen of Change, is credited with starting a movement that has brought creativity into the mainstream conversation in the arts, in business, and in everyday life. She is the best-selling author of more than 40 books uh, of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, she's a poet, songwriter, filmmaker, and playwright. Uh, her book, The Artist's Way, has been translated into 40 languages and has sold over 5 million copies to date. In Write for Life, Julia turns to one of the subjects closest to her heart the art and practice of writing. The book offers practical tools to start, pursue, and finish your writing project. Joel Fotinos was vice president and publisher at Penguin Random House for 21 years, at which point he joined Macmillan to start St. Martin Essentials. He and Julia have worked together and have been friends for decades. Without further ado, please give a warm Banyan welcome to Julia Cameron and Joel Fotinos. Bravo. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear us. And um, we'll, we will start off by saying it's a pleasure to be here uh, and a pleasure to introduce the new book. Uh, and I, I feel that it's a useful book. Uh, and I sat down and read it over myself. And I thought, Gee, she does sound like she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> so I've been a writer. I'm 75 years old. I've been a writer since I was 18. So that's 56 years of practice. Uh, and the book contains the clues and the cues and the tips and the treats uh, that I have learned in those 56 years. So uh, I'd like to introduce Joel Fotinos, who has been for me what we call a believing mirror. He's someone who has been encouraging, helpful, inspirational. Uh, and when I would say to him, I'm thinking about listening, he, he would say, oh, I'd like to hear more about that. And I would write a whole book just to satisfy his curiosity. And that became the listening path. So uh, I think that it's a uh, delight to be able to introduce Joel to my audience uh, because he has been so pivotal in bringing the books to the fore. So uh, I'm going to introduce Joel and Joel can take us off. 
Hi, Julia. No. Thanks. Thank you so much. I always say I'm I'm here as Julia's wingman, um, and um, I'm I'm here not just as her friend and, and editor, but as her fan. And um, I, when you were saying that, Julia, about the fifty something years, I realized that you and I have worked together for about half of that, a little over half of that time. So that's a long time uh, for an author editor relationship. And um, the other thing, Julia, just at the beginning, I want to encourage people to go to your website, juliacameronlive.com, because there's all sorts of amazing things there. If you click, go to the website and click on Julia's art, there's all sorts of, um, there's uh, poems, plays, a mu uh, musicals, a movie. Um, I love the, 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 the little songs you wrote about the flowers, um, et cetera. So... That's my housekeeping. Congratulations. I, this new book is fantastic and the response has been incredible. So thank you. So let's start off with, with how the book starts off, uh, which is with three basic tools, which are familiar to people who know my work. Uh, and it's a chapter called Priming the Pump. Uh, and this is the writing practice that you put in place before you begin your project. Uh, and the, the first tool, uh, and perhaps the most famous tool, uh, is a tool called morning pages. Uh, and they mean just what they say. They're done first thing in the morning, and they are three pages of longhand morning writing about absolutely anything. Uh, and. Uh, you skip topic to topic, uh, saying, I didn't like what Fred said to me in the meeting yesterday. <laughs> I forgot to buy kitty litter. <laughs> I didn't call my sister back. The car has a funny knock in it. I better check it out. So the, um, the morning pages are sort of a, a tool of clearing away, siphoning off negativity. Uh, and uh, I sometimes call them brain drain uh, because that's what they do. They drain off from your mind everything that stands in the way of you and your creativity. So I think it's fair to say morning pages are inspirational. They put you in touch with a larger power uh, and uh, you find yourself saying things that surprise you. So, uh, Joel, do you have anything you want to say about Morning Pages? Well, we're starting to get questions um, about the Morning Pages, but uh, do you want to do questions at the end? Let's do both. Let's do both. Um, some people here have uh, are talking about how much they love the Morning Pages. Um, and we get we have some some of uh, very specific questions like Julia, do you use a pen or pencil when you do your morning pages? I use a two hundred seven Uniball Flowing Writer pen on bold. And what color is the ink? I like black, but I my friend Joel likes blue. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, Julia, uh, what size journal should I use? Well, this is where I say use eight and a half by 11, which is sort of a standard writing size. Uh, because if you use a smaller size, trying to be clever and saying, oh, I'll just write three pages, tiny. What I find is that you miniaturize your thoughts to match your format. So it's better to do eight and a half by 11, which gives you room to ruminate. Um, Julia, do you reread your morning pages? I don't. Uh, I think of them as a form of meditation. So when you are writing morning pages, you're writing down what in meditation practice we call cloud thoughts. They're thoughts that just sort of come cruising through. Uh, and people worry about that they should reread their pages, 
for fear of missing something. But what I have found is that pages are sort of a tough love friend. Uh, and if they, they bring up a topic, <clears throat> they'll bring it up over and over again until you deal with it. So you don't really need to worry about missing something. Pages are a nag. <laughs> um, Julia, can I use my iPad? I've been using it for journaling for years and it works. Well, I tend to say right by hand because there's a direct connection between your heart and your hand. But if it's somebody saying, can I use my iPad or I won't do them at all, I, I would say, go ahead and use your iPad. Um, do you have any recommendations for people who have disabilities that impact their ability to write for longer than a few lines? Well, what I have found uh, is that dictation works. And you can, when you write morning pages, you're sort of dropping down the well uh, to an inner source of inspiration. Uh, and when you dictate, you close your eyes uh, and you drop down the well and you repeat what you hear. So I think dictation is a bona fide way to do pages. There, uh, a number of these are about, uh, should they keep the morning pages or get rid of them? So that's gonna answer several people's questions. Well, I used to save my morning pages faithfully because I was thinking, oh, if I ever do a memoir, I'm going to need to go back and read them. So I better save them. And then I was assigned a memoir, and what I found was that I didn't go back and read them at all. It was as if the fact of writing them down in the first place had made the events sort of indelible. So um, I, I think uh, the next question was, should I save them? Uh, well, a lot of people are asking, um, can they get rid of them? Or do they need to save them? They can get rid of them. Because you do. And yes. I know I do, for sure. You can burn them, fold them, shred them, mutilate them, <laughs> bury them. I have an expression which says, okay, first cremate the pages, then worry about the body. <laughs> um. Advice for busy moms of multiple kids um, whose writing time is in between play dates and changing diapers. Well, it's better that you're doing them at all. Uh, and uh, I had a toddler when I started morning pages uh, and I would get up and I would race to the page uh, and I would get about three pages done before my daughter would wake up. But what I have found is that uh, sometimes people can't get up before their kids. So they need to do morning pages as soon as they can upon awakening. So it might be after you feed the kids breakfast and pack them off to school. And this person says that they're having a problem with their work schedule in the mornings. Can they do night pages instead of morning pages? Well, it's better to do pages at all, but it's better to do them in the morning because in the morning you're laying out a track, sort of a trajectory for the day at hand. Uh, and if you're doing them at night, you're reflecting on a day you've already had and you're powerless to change. But if it comes down to, I, I need to do them at night, uh, or I won't do them at all, then I would say, okay, do them at night, but know that you're not getting the full benefit. Yeah. I mean, the spirit of morning pages is to wake up and drain the brain. Yes. So if you do them at night, you've kind of missed that benefit you just said of starting your day off emptied of whatever it is. 
can I, is it okay to take breaks while writing the morning pages? Well, I think it's dangerous to take breaks because it drags out the amount of time it takes to write pages. So it's better to go straight to the page and write straight through for three pages. Uh, and taking breaks is what I call taking mental cigarette breaks and pausing and thinking, what should I say now? Uh, and I think you can drag your pages out to take a couple of hours if you are taking interruptions. Right. Somebody said, do you use prompts for your morning pages? I don't use prompts. I use what I call first thoughts. Uh, and first thoughts are the things that occur to you when you say, I think I'm going to write. Uh, and then you say, oh, it's cloudy outside. <laughs> I think I'm going to be depressed today by the weather. Uh, and that prompt uh, takes a couple of sentences uh, and leads you into your next prioritized thinking, I think is the way I would put it. <laughs> All right. Maybe just a couple more morning pages and then we can do morning pages at the end. Um, there are many, many questions. Uh, does your morning pages affect what you are currently writing? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think morning pages clear the mind uh, and set you to writing your next project. Uh, but they don't affect it in the sense of shaping it uh, or giving it... Uh, structure so you don't want to expect your morning pages to do more than just drain your brain um somebody said that writing morning pages was a negative experience just in terms of actually doing it how can you make more doing morning pages more positive well i'm sorry that you had a negative experience doing them uh and i i think uh I would have them do a tool I call blasting through blocks, uh, which is listing your angers, your fears, and your resentments, numbering maybe from one to 20, uh, and just putting down on the page the things that are bothering you. Uh, and that will sort of clear away uh, and... Um, I think I think I'm so s sorry about somebody having a negative experience, uh, and I I think uh, I think writing down your negativity doesn't perpetuate it. It sort of clears the air and allows you to ventilate. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't be too concerned about negativity in the pages. And I would say, keep an eye peeled for positivity. Uh, and you'll probably find that there's more of it than you think. That's great. That actually answers several other questions uh, of the same question. And just so people know, it's one side, one side, one side, not three pages, both sides. That's come up a couple of times. Yes, you you want to write three pages, side, side, side. I don't want anybody trying to write six pages, side, 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 side. So, um, And, you know, a lot of answers to these questions, by the way, you go into in the new book. Um, I mean, you answer a lot of these questions that are coming up very specifically in the book. So I just want people to know if we don't get to your, your question, the new book does answer a lot of these questions. Well, thank you. Yes, I had a um, podcast this week with two women who turned out to both be blocked writers. Uh, and I 
wanted them to read the book and take it to heart. I think what I was trying to do with the book was to dismantle a lot of negative mythology that we have around writing. Uh, and uh, so we have things like grab time. We have a mythology that says, if I had a year off on sabbatical, then I would write a novel. Uh, and I found out that maybe if you had a year off, you wouldn't write a novel. But if you have 15 minutes during your day where you can dash to the page, those pages pile up and they do become a novel. Uh, I'm thinking now of an author named Scott Turow who wrote a best-selling book by writing on his commute in the morning. Uh, and uh, he just kept adding up pages uh, and not looking for a vast amount of time, just grabbing the time that he had. Um, what size are the pages? Eight and a half by 11, which she mentioned. There's about four people asking if you keep a journal in addition to you writing morning pages. Um, I get guidance uh, and uh, after I write morning pages, I will ask, what do I need to know about X? And then I will listen uh, and I will write down what I hear. Uh, and that process is probably closer to journaling than morning pages are. Great. Um, maybe we can move on to the next tool, Julia. Okay, so so here we go. Tool number two is called an artist's date. Uh, and it's once a week, go out and have fun. And when I assign this tool, well, I first of all, I assign morning pages. And I say, I have a tool. It's a nightmare. You'll have to get up 45 minutes earlier and work. And people will go, oh, work, work on my creativity. I get it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do morning pages. So they take to the page. But then if I say, now I have a second tool. And for this tool, I want you to go out and have fun. And immediately people get very skeptical uh, and tilt their heads to one side and cross their arms from the front of the room. You see the body language. Uh, and what they're saying is, I don't see what play has to do with working on your creativity. And then I will say, well, we have an expression, the play of ideas, but we don't realize that it's actually a prescription. Play and you will have ideas. So morning pages are work uh, and artist dates are fun. Uh, and a lot of us are very serious. Uh, and I hope my tools are lighthearted uh, because my experience with using them has been lighthearted. So uh, artist dates are going out once a week and doing something enjoyable. So I have a favorite artist day, which is that I go to a pet store where they have a large bunny named George. Uh, and I ask the owner, can I pet George? Uh, and the owner says, yes, go ahead. George likes it. <laughs> and so I, I pet George. Uh, and as I touch his silken coat, I get an experience of glee, uh, happiness, peace, encouragement. Uh, I want to make it sound like George is my higher power, uh, but uh, he, he almost is. So if you want to take an artist's date and you're a little stuck about what to do, you can go a sense at a time. I think I'm going to take an artist's date about my sense of taste. And you go to a fantastic new Italian restaurant. 
I think I'm going to take an artist state against about my sense of smell. And you go to a bakery. I think I'm going to take an artist state against me about my sense of touch. And you follow me into the pet store and pet George the bunny. So going a, a sense at a time can give you ideas for artist states. And I think it's important to say that the pandemic helped us. Uh, and uh, we artist states typically are taken outside of the house. But during the pandemic, when we weren't allowed to go out of the house, we had to do artist states with our imagination. So we might take a bubble bath. We might make a pot of soup. We might bake a pie. We might do a drawing. We might dance barefoot to drum music. Uh, anything that engages your sense of fun. Question here, uh, do I have to do the artist date alone? Oh, I didn't say that, but yes, you do have to do it alone because it's like if you're going to the movies with a friend, half of you is watching the movie and half of you is watching your friend watch the movie. So artist dates are in, about watching your own consciousness and your own delight. Uh, and sometimes people say to me, Julia, I think I fell in love. <laughs> and I would say, yes. And they will say, with myself. So artist states are uh, an exercise in benevolence. Uh, as we play, we learn to think of the universe as being more playful. Uh, and again, it's a place where humor comes into play. Uh, and I think uh, it's important to say, have a light heart. Okay, Joel. Um, somebody said, can you give some examples of artist dates that don't cost money, which you did. I mean, petting George the bunny, bubble baths, uh, museums always have uh, free days. And, and by the way, juliacameronlive.com, if you go to Julia's art on that page, it's free. And that's a great artist date. Oh, thank what, you, Joel. And you mentioned, you've already mentioned some of your favorite artist dates. Uh, somebody said that they go out and get inspired on their artist date. But when they yes. come back, um, it never gets channeled. Um, any advice on how to channel quickly that inspiration from the artist state when they come back? Well, it sounds to me like this person is looking for a way to make the experience of the artist state into usable work. Uh, and I don't think that's the point. I think we have an inner well that we we fish when we're making art and we sort of hook beautiful coy uh, ideas. Uh, and what happens sometimes is we're working flat out uh, and we overfish our well. Uh, and then when we go back the next time to make art, we, we find that images are elusive and our well is empty. Uh, and the artist state replenishes the well, but it shouldn't be too literal, you know, like you don't do an artist date that directly connects to your project. You, you do something whimsical uh, and you allow sort of, uh, I think the way to put it is that you're allowing the higher power to work in your life uh, and sometimes we call it the muse or the universe or obi-wan kenobi uh, but what it does uh, is refill the inner well so don't try so hard to make it work yeah so um joining a a class like knitting class does that count even though there are others there that would not count as an artist date right or well, would it 
it depends on how concentrated you you would be on your own experience if you're constantly aware of others then that isn't a good artist state but if you are self-centered enough to say oh i'm just going to knit and pay attention to my knitting uh, that might be an artist state yeah let's move on i'm watching the time um we can always answer some more of these if we have time at the end okay thank you joel <laughs> I'm, I'm the timekeeper so the third tool in the priming the pump is walking uh, and i say go a couple times a week go for about 20 minutes uh, and walk out empty-handed without a, an iphone uh, without uh, access to anything but your own consciousness so in other words don't take your dog because if you take your dog you'll find yourself taking your dog's walk your dog will be saying oh look at that handsome rottweiler oh look at that adorable cocker spaniel uh, and what you want to do is keep it to your own consciousness uh, and tune in to your environment uh, and it doesn't matter whether you live in the city or the country uh, the the sights that you see are enough so walking twice a week uh, you stretch your body and you stretch your mind so i think we should move on to yep. some of the tools uh, in the new book so joel do you have a, one that you particularly want to talk about yeah well um you have a new tool um which is called the daily quota and that's like the fourth tool when you're using right for life so maybe you can talk about that well a daily quota is a small amount of writing that you commit yourself to doing daily uh, and it should be a low enough amount that you can easily do it so uh, if i'm writing a screenplay uh, it's maybe three pages if i'm writing prose which is more dense it's maybe a page and a half or two uh, and what you do with your daily quota is you write it and you put it aside uh, and you don't write more than your daily quota you you find yourself writing just your daily quota uh, and i i think it's important to say that self-worth builds up by by your accountability to the quota uh, and you find yourself saying oh i've done two pages four pages six pages eight pages uh, and i think we have a tendency to think uh, when we are looking at a project oh i need to be able to write it all at once I need to be able to write it fast uh, and what I have found with the daily quota is that if you slow down uh, your writing becomes richer your writing becomes something that you can count on so um so that's my scoop on daily quota. yeah well you also have a another um thing in the book another tool in the book called writing stations which I I love so writing stations are places that you decide you're comfortable writing so um I have four writing stations in my house I live up a mountain in Santa Fe uh, and uh, so I'm a little bit removed from civilization so I have a library, which is a large square room, which you can hopefully see behind me. Uh, and uh, I, I write straightforward prose in the library. Then I have a writing station in my living room, which has a large plate glass window that stares out at the mountains. 
uh, and that's where I write more whimsically uh, and uh, expansively. So your writing station is a place where you think, oh, here's where I write. So it becomes sort of a, um, a bribe to yourself. When you sit in the writing station, it triggers writing. Um, and you talk to um, people always say, well, I'm so busy. But when they buy Write for Life, they usually have a writing project, whether it's a book or a screenplay or poetry or songs or something. But if they say, I'm so busy, you have a tool in there to help them just find bits of time to work on. Well, when we say I'm too busy, we mean I'm too busy to do it perfectly. So I have a tool which dismantles perfectionism. Uh, and it's a simple tool, but very powerful. And you write, if I didn't have to do it perfectly, I'd. And then number two, if I didn't have to do it perfectly, I'd. Number three, if I didn't have to do it perfectly, I'd. Uh, and you fill into 10. Uh, and what you soon find uh, is that you don't have to do it perfectly uh, and that perfection is a myth uh, and it's something we use to beat ourselves up. So by dismantling perfectionism, you're able to get to the page. Yeah. This book, by the way, is packed with so many practical tips about getting started, finishing, procrastination, um, everything you could think of. Several questions here basically are about when you do your daily quota, can you edit as you go along? So the answer is don't do that. Uh, you're trying to do something that I call laying track. Uh, and laying track is left over from our days as a continent that needed railroads. Uh, and every day the crew would have a certain number of miles that they had to lay track. So I, I'm asking you to lay track uh, and to not rewrite, not polish, not obsess, to simply lay the track down every day, meet your daily quota and move on. Uh, and what I find uh, is that drafts that are done this way come out interesting, original, uh, and um, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of originality. We have a mythology that says, if I'm going to write, I have to write better than anyone else has ever written. Uh, and we have a spirit of competition uh, with other writers. Uh, and what I have found uh, is that it's not, quote, originality that makes you resonate with the piece. It's if the piece is heartfelt enough. So I think um, I think we need to remember that originality has as its root the word origin, uh, and we are the origin of our own work. Uh, and instead of saying, oh, Stephen King already wrote this better, we say, oh, I guess I have something in common with Stephen King. <laughs> and so we don't compete, we, we enjoy. There is a lot of information in the book about editing and when to edit and all of that. So there's a lot of questions about that. I just want people to know that the, many of these questions are answered in the book. Julia, several people have asked, um, you wrote a book 25, 26, something years ago called The Right to Write. How is this book different than The Right to Write? 
Well, the right to write was a sort of manifesto that said, we're all writers and we all have a, a, a right to try writing. Uh, and uh, it was sort of inspirational and exhortative uh, and encouraging. Uh, and this book has many more nuts and bolts. Uh, it's, it's much more hands-on, practical. Uh, here are the questions that arise when you're trying to finish a draft. Here's what you need to do about them. Uh, and um, I think we should talk about inner critics. I think most of us have a, a critic that sort of perches on our shoulder uh, and says negative things. And when we write morning pages, we hear the critic, but we say, thank you for sharing. So my critic is named Nigel. And Nigel is a gay British interior decorator. Uh, and his standards are so lofty that I will never write well enough to please Nigel. Uh, and Nigel will say to me, Julia, you're boring. Julia, nobody wants to hear about the weather. Julia, uh, and he, he keeps up a, a subversive stream of negative comments. But what I have learned to do because I do morning pages, which remember we're all doing before we get into the nuts and bolts of this book, uh, what we do when we do morning pages there's no wrong way to do them. So when Nigel says something negative, we just turn to Nigel and say, Nigel, thank you for sharing. Uh, and it goes from being sort of a booming voice of doom, you're boring, to being a wee peeping cartoon character uh, where Nigel will say, you're boring. <laughs> and then you say, Nigel, I've got you miniaturized, uh, and I'm not going to listen to you. So I think it's very important to say that morning pages miniaturize your critic, uh, and this becomes a portable skill. So when you're working on your projects uh, and your critic, your Nigels, start to say something negative, you've trained yourself to move past them. Uh, and Nigel can no longer stop you in your tracks. So uh, several people, Julia, are asking um, who are some of the people or books that have inspired you to write um, or, or motivated you to write? Well, I had a calling to write. Uh, I I started writing poetry when I was a teenager. Uh, and I found myself saying, oh, this is fun. Uh, and I found myself having an experience of enjoyment with writing. Uh, and I didn't read many books on how to write, or I wouldn't say that books were a primary source of inspiration, I would say that practicing the toolkit gave me inspiration. So, but I want to single out one book uh, that belongs to a friend of mine, Natalie Goldberg. Uh, and she wrote a book called Writing Down the Bones. Uh, and in it, she talks about writing practice and just keep your hand moving across the page. Uh, and I found uh, that Natalie and I had many similar experiences with moving our hand across the page and becoming inspired. Um, Julia, somebody said, this ties in a little bit to your Stephen King answer, but they, when they think about their writing, they think about the flood of writing that's already out there and how this person's writing may be meaningless or that they're not sharing anything new. So what's the point? 
How do you combat that? So this is where I sound like a fanatic. Uh, and I say, please do morning pages. Please do morning pages. Because when you do morning pages, you become interested in your own process. Uh, and they are sort of a witness to your life. Uh, and I think that thinking about the odds is a drink of emotional poison. Uh, and I, I think taking your eyes off of everybody else and putting them onto yourself uh, gives you strength. So I have an expression, treating yourself like a precious object will make you strong. So I think treating yourself like a precious object means that you don't compare yourself negatively to others. You find yourself saying, oh, I had a good time on my artist date. And you find yourself filling the well. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, That's great. Um, Julie, I don't think you've talked about um, another one of your great ideas in this book, which is called Lowering the Bar. Well, all right, we have an idea that to be writers, we need to sort of blog ourselves forward, uh, that writing takes a great deal of discipline uh, and that it's hard. Uh, and I, I think... Uh, we carry this over to the rest of our life and we say, what do I need to do today? Uh, and we maybe make a to-do list. Uh, and lowering the bar means taking your to-do list and chopping it in half and saying, I will do half of this today. Uh, and if you've set your daily quota low enough, uh, when you lower the bar, your imagination will say, oh, I can write a little bit today, uh, and you'll write. So I think uh, lowering the bar uh, is an act of kindliness to yourself. Uh, and I, I think uh, that the book encourages you to be kind. This is, um, I think this is the first time we've gotten this question. Do you, or I have anyway, you probably, do you do morning pages and daily quota seven days a week or five days a week like a job? I think that's a good question. Well, I do it every day. So. That's seven days a week. Because what happens if you pause uh, is that you panic. And you take two days off, and then it's difficult to get started again. So I think it's better for you to try and do it every day. I love the idea, Julia, that you, you say in, in the book that this book, the new book, Write for Life, is really a love letter to writing and to writers. And can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think it really talk, it really goes to the heart of why you wrote this book and why it's so beneficial for people who read it and use the program. Well, I think it seeks to dismantle a, a lot of the negative mythology. If I had enough time, then I would be a writer. If I had... Uh, enough discipline that I would be a writer if I had enough focused concentration that I would be a writer uh, and uh, it says actually you only need to do a little bit to be to be a writer uh, and um, I I think I've lost the train of thought about um, a love letter to writers and to writing and your, you know, the seed of where this book came from with that, as that love letter. 
Well, I love other writers. I love to write. Uh, and I'm always sorry when I hear how painful people are making writing. Uh, and I thought I would try and write a book that said, let us coax you into writing. Let us use bribes, uh, which people sometimes think bribes are cheating. But I have found that my writer is easily bribed. So I would say, if I finish this essay on vulnerability, I'll take you out for a piece of cherry pie. <laughs> and so this book was written on cherry pie and soy chai lattes. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I think it's a love letter to writers tenderheartedly trying to say to them, don't make it so hard, sweetheart. Make it a little bit easier. Uh, and so uh, I, I devote a lot of the book toward laying track, grabbing time, having the courage to put down our first thoughts instead of waiting to be brilliant later. Uh, Perfectionism gets dismantled. Yes. Um, so, gosh, there's so many of these questions that are directly answered right in the book and also in the artist's way, the original book as well, if you already have for people who have that. Um, what, how does your, how does um, your morning pages and your daily quota change when you're traveling? Well, it becomes more difficult. Uh, and uh, so this is why I have experience with what it's like writing the pages late in the day. Uh, when I'm traveling, uh, I, I try and get up early enough to write morning pages. But if I don't get them completely done, I take them with me. Uh, and then I write them in air, airports. Uh, and I write them in strange hotel rooms. Uh, and I, I think the ideal is to keep them in place no matter what. Uh, and that's what I try to do. A number of questions about procrastination specifically. What advice you have for, the, for people who procrastinate? Well, this is where we use blasting through blocks the tool that says, write down your angers, your fears, your resentments about the project at hand. Uh, and then hopefully you, you can share your, your list of negatives with someone who is for you a believing mirror. A believing mirror is somebody who's encouraging, uh, hopeful, uh, fond of you fond of writing uh, and uh, you just read them the list and they don't need to fix anything. They just need to listen. Uh, and what happens with blasting through blocks is that then you find you can go to the page. So it's a very simple, straightforward tool, but it's very powerful. It's in the book, there's a whole section on each of these kind of topics, criticism. This one's on procrastination. It's page 58 in the new book. Um, Julia, questions about when you do the daily quota, is it free form just kind of flowing out of you or do you need to have kind of an idea in your head of where you're going, a structure? Well, I think it's an exercise in faith. Uh, and so you write what comes next, uh, and then you write what comes after that. Uh, and my experience has been uh, that I don't need an outline uh, in this process. I lay track. 
uh, and I go start to finish. Uh, and then there's a section in the book about how to move from a first draft to a second draft to a third draft to a polish. Uh, and that's something that uh, is probably too complicated to right. go to right now. Right. And we, we have about we have about four minutes left. I'm so sorry we can't get to everybody's questions. I've, we've gotten to a lot of them, and I've tried to type some of the answers to people as well. Um, uh, this one, um, this is, a, I mean, most of the questions often are about morning pages, or many of them. Morning pages and meditation. Mm -hmm. Should you do... Um, are morning pages like a meditation or should and can you do morning pages before or after meditation okay morning pages are a form of meditation uh, but you do them first uh, and then you move into your sitting meditation uh, and here's why uh, if you do conventional meditation and skip your morning pages and you're going to meditation first what happens is you have an issue, you take it into meditation, uh, and after 20 minutes or so, you come out of meditation and you find that you've sort of meditated away your concern uh, and that you don't need to do anything about it. Uh, and so it keeps you stuck. So if you do morning pages uh, after 20 minutes or so of writing, you'll find yourself saying, oh, I goddamn well better do something about this. Uh, and morning pages move you into action. So um, I would say do morning pages first, which lays out a track for you, uh, and then meditate. I don't do sitting meditation. I consider my three pages of morning pages to be my meditation. Um, just typing out some answers to people um, to try to get them. Julia, there's so many people who have written just saying thank you uh, for the artist's way. Thank you for the, the tools. Um, by the way, this was meant to be a Q&A. Somebody said, why are there so many questions? Because this is a, this is a conversation with Q&A. Um, and if we didn't answer your question again, I apologize. We we really did try. We got to a lot. This is probably more questions than we've ever answered in in a one hour time period. But um, if you have the artist's way, a lot of your questions are answered there. They're also answered in this book, Right for Life. Julia, do you have any last um, things to say to everybody? I want to say, allow me to help you. Allow me to give you little tips. Uh, and uh, I think it's important uh, to have humor uh, and not to make it deadly earnest. Uh, and uh, so I, I use rhyming uh, and uh, I, I write little things like, uh, here we have gone the whole hour and I'm wearing sunglasses. Right, we forgot that. It's like, why is she wearing sunglasses? <laughs> uh, and uh, the answer is that I had eye surgery uh, and they said, now you can't wear any makeup. <laughs> and I thought, oh dear God. So I wrote a little poem, uh, which I'll read to you now. Uh, and it's an example of using humor to dismantle what previously seemed like a serious situation. This little poem goes out to my glasses, who work as a shield until this time passes. Here's to dark glasses to hide my eyelashes. I feel quite glam. In fact, I am. My writing's mysterious. It makes folks delirious. But simple tools are the trick that makes a writer tick. So I share what I know and lead others so. Life without makeup is a dare I will take up. I'll wear my shades and masquerade 
as a competent teacher who isn't a preacher. I have stories to tell to avoid writer's hell. I love to write, blind or with sight. That is the perfect way to, to end. And uh, Julia, thank you so much. I hope uh, everybody has really enjoyed this. And uh, you asked wonderful questions, everybody, and people said so many nice words uh, to you, Julia, for the work. And um, this is great. So uh, we'll have Banyan Books host come back on. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Banyan you. Books. Thank you, Banyan Books. Thank you both. This was um, absolutely delightful, you guys. And um, Joel, I know you have to you have to be somewhere, so if you need to run right away, that's fine. Um, but it's been uh, just an absolute delight. I love the sunglasses. I love the sunglasses. Home. <laughs> and actually, sorry, so, something that really uh, struck me. I mean, there's so many things that you said that were meaningful for me, but uh, this idea of the believing mirror, I'm definitely taking that piece. I just absolutely love that. So thank you so much. Um, and just a note to everyone, um, Julia Cameron's new book, Write for Life, is available from banyan.com. That's B-A-N-Y-E-N.com. You can learn more about uh, Julia Cameron's work at juliacameronlive.com. And so again, on behalf of Banyan Books, thank you all for coming out today. And thank you, Julia Cameron and Joel. For the team. You're welcome, Jacob. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Julia. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.